Hey, Chef Bates here again. We are going to go through Chapter 4, The Flow of Food Out of Serve Safe. This is the introduction to this very important topic. Uh, today we're just going to talk about preventing cross-contamination and how to use thermometers correctly. To keep food safe, you have to apply what you learn in the Serve Safe program throughout the flow of food. This is the path food takes through the operation. It begins when we buy it, and it ends when we serve it. Detailed practices for each phase are covered in later chapters, but we as restaurant professionals are responsible for the safety of the food at every point in the flow, and a lot of stuff can potentially happen to it. For example, a frozen food might be safe when it leaves the processor's plant. However, on the way to the supplier's warehouse, the food might thaw. Once in your operation, that food might not get stored correctly, or it might not be cooked to the correct internal temperature. These mistakes can add up and cause a foodborne illness. That's why it is important to understand how to prevent time temperature abuse and how to prevent cross-contamination. To keep food safe through the flow of food, You've got to prevent cross-contamination, and you've got to prevent time temperature abuse. Pathogens, they can move around easily in any restaurant, any place where food is made. They can move around pretty easily. They can be spread from food or unwashed hands to prep areas, equipment, utensils, or other food. Cross-contamination can happen at almost any point in the flow of food. When you know how and where it can happen, it is fairly easy to prevent cross-contamination. The most basic way is to keep raw and ready-to-eat food away from each other. Most foodborne illnesses happen because TCS food has been time temperature abused. Remember, TCS food has been time temperature abused any time it remains between 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature danger zone. Uh, we call it that because pathogens grow pretty quick there. But most pathogens grow much faster between 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Check out the little red uh, box over here where it says pathogens grow rapidly. If the temperature danger zone is 41 to 135, 70 to 125 is like the super danger zone. Food is being temperature abused whenever it's handled in the following ways. It's cooked to the wrong internal temperature. It's held at the wrong temperature or it's cooled or reheated incorrectly. The longer the food stays in the temperature danger zone, the more time pathogens have to grow. To keep food safe, you must reduce the time it spends in this temperature range. If food is held in this range for four or more hours, you must throw it out. Four or more hours. Throw it away. Four or more hours. Four. Hmm. Sheesh. Remember that. So how do you prevent cross-contamination from happening? Well, we already have talked about some ways. Uh, here's some more practical ways are, hey, why don't we buy food that doesn't require us to prep it or even really touch it? You can buy pre-cooked chicken breast. Uh, you can buy pre-chopped lettuce. And uh, uh, you, through a company like Cisco, you can get almost everything that you need to uh, make pre-made. It's not especially great, and you're certainly not a scratch kitchen, but you're a very safe kitchen. But if you are going to make everything yourself and you've only got one big prep table for different types of food, it's very important that you prep your raw meat, fish, and poultry at a different time than your ready-to-eat food. You've got to clean and sanitize your work surfaces and utensils between each type of food you're preparing. Also, very important, if you're preparing ready-to-eat food and raw food, do the ready-to-eat food first and the raw food second. That'll definitely reduce the chance of cross-contamination. So throughout this process, you're going to have to teach the people that work for you which food items have to be checked, how often, and who is responsible for it. you got to make sure your food handlers understand what to do, how to do it, and why it is so important. And along the way, obviously, you need to make sure that all of your employees have the correct kind of thermometers on them. You should give them their own. Have them use their timers and prep areas to check how long food is in the temperature danger zone. Have them clean and sanitize their own probe thermometers so that they're able to keep track. They're able to monitor time and temperature. While they're doing this, really wise idea is to have your food handlers record those temperatures they're taking regularly. Make sure they write down when the temperatures were taken. 
There are simple forms online for this. Uh, you can post them on clipboards, outside of coolers and freezers, near prep areas, next to cooking and holding equipment. You want to have some procedures in place that are going to limit the time that TCS food spends in the temperature danger zone. Now, here's an example. Uh, let's say that you are prepping cases and cases and cases of raw chicken. But you know that each case takes your worker about one hour to prep. Don't allow him to take out three cases at a time. Put in place a policy that only one case can come out at a time. That's the way that you limit the that's the way that you limit the amount of time that food will spend in the temperature danger zone. And the last thing that we can do to prevent cross contamination is make sure that everybody knows uh, what to do if time and temperature standards are not met. For example, if you hold soup on a steam table and its temperature falls below 135 degrees Fahrenheit, after two hours you could reheat it to the correct temperature or you might throw it out. But if it was there for four hours, it spent four hours in the temperature danger zone, the only thing you can do is throw it away. Make sure everybody knows the rules and you don't have to worry about what they do. To keep food safe, you must control the amount of time it spends in the temperature danger zone. This requires monitoring, as we've said. And the most important tool you have to monitor temperature is the thermometer. There are three types of thermometers that we're going to talk about it because they are the ones most commonly used in restaurants. Bimetallic stemmed thermometers, digital thermometers like thermocouples and thermistors, and infrared thermometers. A bimetallic stem thermometer, we'll talk about that one first because it's the one we use the most often. It can check temperatures from 0 degrees to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really helpful for checking temperatures during the flow of food. For example, you can use it to check food temperatures during receiving, and you can also use it to check food temperatures in a hot or cold holding unit like a buffet table. A bimetallic stem thermometer measures temperature through its stem. When checking temperatures, you want to insert the stem into the food all the way up to the dimple. You've got to do this because the sensing area of the thermometer goes from the tip of the stem to the dimple. It's great for checking large and thick food. However, it's not that practical for thin food such as hamburger patties because a hamburger patty is not as thick as the sensing area of the bimetallic stem thermometer. So let's say that you are purchasing some bimetallic stem thermometers for your restaurant. They need to have three features. They need to have the calibration nut which is just underneath the indicator head. That's how you adjust the thermometer to make it accurate. It needs to have easy to read markings on that indicator head because clear markings reduce the chance that someone's gonna misread the thermometer and get the wrong temperature. It's gotta be scaled to two degree increments and it has to have a clear dimple. The little indentation on the stem that shows the, where the sensing area is, where the temperature sensing area is. Say you don't want a bimetallic stem thermometer because you like the fancy ones, so you're going to get yourself a digital thermometer. You're going to be purchasing either a thermocouple or a thermistor. Those are the two types of digital thermometers that are used in restaurant work. And if you ever see a question on SurfSafe about a thermistor or a thermocouple, just remember they're just talking about digital thermometers and using a fancy name. The tools are really, really similar. The only difference between them is the technology inside. Both are displaying temperature digitally. Both have a sensing area that's located on the very, very tip. This means that you don't have to insert them all the way into food like you do with a bimetallic stem thermometer to get a correct reading. Makes them great for thin food. And they come with all kinds of cool different attachments. They come with surface probes that are used to check the temperature of flat surfaces like a griddle. They have air probes, that are, uh, air attachments, so that you can measure the temperature inside of a cooler or an oven. Immersion probes for checking the temperature of liquids such as soups or sauces or frying oil. And penetration uh, probes for actually checking food, just like you would with a bimetallic stem thermometer. The only difference is you can only have to use the tip. So you can use them with very thin foods like hamburger patties or fish fillets. The next thermometer, fun! It's the laser gun! Everybody loves the laser thermometers, but they're only good for two things. They're only good for surface temperatures. That's it. They're only good for surface temperatures and surface temperatures of food and surface temperatures of cooking um, equipment. They aren't going to measure the interior temperature of food, and they're, um, you certainly can't use them to figure out how hot soup is. Um, for those, you would need an immersion um, probe thermometer or a bimetallic stem thermometer, right? Uh, but they are pretty cool. 
and they're fun to work with. There are a couple rules about them, though. You want to hold the thermometer as close to the food or equipment as you can without touching it. You got to make sure there's nothing between the little laser and the food. So don't try to take a temperature reading through metal. Or, and certainly don't do it through glass because the laser can bounce off the glass and shoot you in the eye and make you shoot your eye out. Always follow manufacturer's directions while you're using a laser thermometer, please. That would be great. Hey, there's a couple more that we don't really use for food, but they sure are fun. Uh, maximum registering thermometers are these cool tools. We have one of these. We use it to make sure that our dishwasher, the final rinse, is hitting 180 degrees. Um, it only is going to tell you the highest temperature reach. That's what it's good for. All you have to do is put this baby on the dish rack with the rest of the dishes, and it's going to display the highest temperature recorded during the dish cycle. It's great for checking the final rinse temperature of a dishwashing machine. Uh, another t type of thing is uh, maximum registering tape. does the exact same thing, but it's disposable. You just uh, take the little sticker and you put it on the outside of the dish rack, and it's going to turn colors if it gets to the right temperature. So on this particular tape, it has a little blue bar. Actually, it looks kind of purple. And that bar is going to turn um, bright orange if the dishwasher final rinse is going to hit 180 degrees. That way we know we're safe. The last uh, specialty thermometer is called a TTI, a time temperature indicator. Now these are cool because it's not just measuring temperature, it's also measuring the length of time that that sticker stays at that temperature. So these are great. Uh, they're attached to packaging by a lot of different suppliers and the color change appears in the window if the food has been time temperature abused during shipment or storage. Now the color change can't be reversed, so they can't like cheat. <laughs> If you see it on there, you know that that food has not spent more than one or two or three hours in the temperature danger zone during its entire um, transportation. Plus, it tells you the highest temperature it got to. These are awesome. They're kind of expensive, but some of the best vendors provide these on all of their food. Sure, every kind of thermometer that you might use in your restaurant, you got to know how to use. Uh, general rule of thumb, follow the manufacturer's directions. But one thing that we know that we have to do, manufacturers are going to tell us, but we know we have to do, is we have to wash and rinse and sanitize our probe thermometers before we stick them back into food. They have to be washed, rinsed, sanitized, and air dried regularly. And you have to make sure that the storage case of the thermometer is clean as well. You don't want to just clean the thermometer and then stick it back into the little sleeve that's full of raw chicken. That didn't do you any good. Be sure the sanitizing solution you use for your probe thermometers is food grade, right? Obviously. In the picture, they're using probe wipes. This is the sort of the industry standard. ServeSafe doesn't really talk about them much, but they are the industry standard. So don't be surprised if you see a question about a probe wipe. A probe wipe is a, uh, only used to sanitize the probe. It's not used to clean it. Over a period of time, thermometers lose their accuracy. Uh, when this happens, the thermometer has got to be calibrated or adjusted to give it a correct reading. You've got to make sure your thermometers are accurate by calibrating them regularly. Keep in mind these three things, please. Some thermometers can't be calibrated, and you got to throw them in the trash. They're trash. They don't work anymore. Others, especially the digital ones, are going to have to be sent back to the manufacturer for calibration. And whenever you're calibrating the, your thermometer, you're changing what it reads when it uh, is measuring a food temperature, you better follow the manufacturer's directions, please. So we're going to calibrate thermometers at some specific times. If they've been bumped or dropped, if they've been exposed to an extreme temperature uh, before deliveries, before every shift, uh, certainly. And there's a couple different ways that we can go about calibrating, which is, again, just adjusting a thermometer so that it reads correctly. Uh, we can adjust it using the ice point method, which is to adjust it based at the temperature at which water freezes. And the other is the boiling point method, which is to adjust it based on the temperature at which water boils. Seems pretty self-explanatory. If you're going to use the boiling point method, which, by the way, is not nearly as popular as the ice point method because your hands have to hover above boiling water, what you're going to do is you're going to take your th um, you're going to boil water first, <laughs> of course. Then you're going to take your thermometer and you're going to put it into the um, boiling water so much so that the dimple is underwater. However, the tip is not touching the metal. 
the, the, it's very important that the thermometer never touch the pot, that it's only touching water. And then what you're going to do is you're going to adjust the reading by turning the calibration nut so that it is reading the temperature at which water boils, which is 212 degrees. How you complete step three, this last part of adjusting the thermometer, is going to depend on your own individual thermometer. Some of them, you're going to have to read the instructions from the manufacturer. Sorry, reading. Much more common, ice point method. For this, you're going to fill a big old cup full of ice. You're going to fill it with some water. Then you're going to stir it well. Add your probe thermometer. And once again, you want to insert it all the way into the water so that the dimple is submerged. The entire sensing area has got to be in the water. Once again, you want to make sure it doesn't touch the glass. And you're going to hold it there steady for about 30 seconds until the indicator stops moving, just like we did with the boiling point method. And then we're going to adjust it. But this time, we're not adjusting it to the point at which water boils. We're adjusting it to the point at which water freezes, which is 32 degrees. So, pretty straightforward, right? When you're using thermometers, uh, you got to make sure they're accurate, obviously. you got to make sure they work, that they're calibrated. Um, your thermometers have to be accurate to within plus or minus 2 degrees if you're measuring food. That's an important number. Plus or minus 2 degrees for food. Plus or minus 3 degrees for air if you're measuring air temperature. It's only plus or minus 3. Glass thermometers are frequently used with candy making, and you'll never find those in a commercial restaurant unless the glass is shatterproof because, wow, that would be a terrible physical contaminant, wouldn't it? <laughs> Whenever you're checking temperatures, you want to insert the thermometer um, into the thickest part of the food because we want to find out if it's all the way cooked. So obviously, we're going to find the thickest part, the part that might still be raw, potentially. And then we're going to take a second reading somewhere else so that we have an idea that the entire piece is cooked all the way. Remember that with the bimetallic stem therm thermometer, uh, getting a good reading may take up to 30 seconds. Digital thermometers, the thermostores, and the thermocouples, two seconds. Two seconds, three seconds, and you'll have a reading. And it's a digital reading, so you don't have to wait for it to, like, steady on the indicator dial. But bimetallic stem thermometers are still quite accurate, and they're very inexpensive. So, there you go. You're a thermometer master. Congratulations. Thank you.